Wait a minute. It's just me, Richard Hart. And yes, I am reliving my childhood, and maybe yours, too. Because right here are all of the afternoons that I spent reading Robert Heinlein, A.E. Van Vogt, Isaac Asimov, all the great science fiction writers. They're here. And the monsters, Bela Lugosi, Boris Karloff, all the creatures they played are here in the private collection of this man, Forrest J. Ackerman, probably the greatest science fiction and fantasy fan in the world. And tonight we're going to meet the man and some of the creatures from your movie past. Right now, though, here's Jan with the rest of tonight's evening magazine. When I was a boy, I spent my Saturdays with monsters. Popcorn coursed through my veins and jujubes and Nico wafers. The first movie I ever saw was Invaders from Mars. We grew up then on Outer Limits. It, the thing, the monster who and the creature from, and we loved them all. Years later, I find myself in Hollywood, about to meet a man who developed the same love of the strange that I had, but this fellow never outgrew it. 4SJ of California? Who dares disturb the sleep of the vampire? Enter at your own risk. Inside, it's obvious why the master of this mansion is called the world's greatest science fiction fan. Here are 17 rooms full of science fiction and full of more than 50 years of monster movie memorabilia. This is a wonderland for any science fantasy fan. And there, presiding over it all, the high priest of fantasy, by day a mild-mannered agent for science fiction writers, Forrest J. Ackerman. I'm afraid I wasted the first nine years of my life, but in October 1926, a magazine called Amazing Stories jumped right off the newsstand, grabbed hold of me, said, take me home, little boy, you will love me. And that became a way of life, started a lifelong love affair with science fiction. That happened during the Great Depression, so little Foray coaxed money from his parents by getting his fan letters printed in all those publications for 10 years. This is the room of dead monsters. We have props in here from <laughs> pictures like, well, for instance, here's the Pteranodon that was trying to fly away with Fay Ray and King Kong, and uh, next to him, the Stegosaurus, the very bomb that brought down King Kong. They look in sad shape. They were used in the movie a long time ago. In 1933, yes, and here uh, we have the Golden Gate Bridge from uh, the film it, it Came From Beneath the Sea. Beneath the bridge is the creature that came 20 million miles to Earth. That's called an emir. It uh, fought with this elephant, animated by Ray Harryhausen, and then over here we have life masks of all the, the mighty. Up there in the left-hand top corner is Boris Karloff as he appeared in 1931 when he was making Frankenstein. Next to it, well, that's myself when I was alive. <laughs> How much do you think what's in this room is worth? Well, I'd say priceless. I mean, the, well, Bela Lugosi's Dracula ring, you know, if you were to have an auction, I don't know, it would take somebody like a a Frank Sinatra or Sammy Davis or some independently wealthy person, I suppose. To not, now, I wouldn't sell it anyway, but uh, but uh, there really are so many one-of-a-kind things here that I think priceless is about the only way you can sum it up. Forey's home isn't a public museum, but he does not turn away other fans. He holds an open house once a week, and it seems there's always someone from somewhere in the world on his phone asking for information. From a meeting with the mayor of Los Angeles recently came a promise. The mayor was so thrilled with Forey's collection that he promised the city will soon have a new modern structure devoted to properly housing all of this neat stuff. And the list is endless. Hundreds of copies of Dracula and Frankenstein books, and his favorites, the actual model space vehicles used in War of the Worlds. And his most beautiful possession, the only copy of the robot mistress from the first science future film, Metropolis. I would gladly steal batteries for this woman. When you bought your first amazing stories here, back in 1926, they weren't c calling it science fiction then, were they? No, they melded together uh, two words, scientific and fiction, into the single term, scientifiction. And where did the term sci-fi come from? 
came from me. <laughs> in uh, 1954, I was driving around in the car, had the radio on, and I think somebody must have said something about hi-fi. And since science fiction is never far from the top of my mind, it, it just seemed suddenly a, a natural hi-fi sci-fi. If you weren't working in science fiction and collecting all these fantasy objects, what would you be doing today? I suppose in a, in a parallel life, I would have liked to have been some kind of an entertainer, a singer like Al Jolson, who was my great favorite, or a, a Marie Chevalier and have the adulation of, of millions of people. But on a much smaller scale, I get that virtually every day of my life. Uh, started uh, oh about 10 years ago i think i picked up the phone and for the first time a, a young voice said to me mr ackerman there's no use telling you my name I, i'm 20 years old and i i just wanted to say you made my childhood and then he was gone and i stood there kind of stunned well what do you know i, I was just kind of doing my monthly job editing the magazine and uh, imagine that some young fellow said i made his childhood what I have to say next might disappoint a few fans. This man, with his head so far into the stars, is actually down to earth. Forrest J. Ackerman does not believe in UFOs. He has no time for astrology, and he abhors the use of drugs to expand the imagination. He's hardly monstrous. Why, he feels guilty when he swats a fly. And what about an afterlife? I very much uh, hope to die next to a cryogenic machine. I would have the feeling of time travel, that it's not the end of me, that I'm going to make a comeback, and I'll close my eyes in 1999, we'll say, and open them up in, in 2026, and there'll be all of a, a quarter of a century of science fiction movies to catch up with, and all the books and magazines to read. This is the award I received when Boris Karloff and I were honored by the Count Dracula Society, the Anne Radcliffe Award. A $2,000 collector's item, first issue of Weird Tales. It oozed along for 31 years. And this curious little cutie is from Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Well, this good friend of mine who uh, I guess looks a little bit like me is uh, wearing the costume that I sported on the sidewalks of New York, 1939, 41 years ago at the first World Science Fiction Convention. You think you'll ever grow up? I hope not. <laughs> Buck Rogers here. I think there may be one zap left. Smile when you say Flash Gordon, partner, because this is Buck Rogers speaking.